to see the Princeton participation rate um, in annual giving drop from 60%, which is, I think, pretty high. I mean, that's every year, 60% of alumni are giving some amount of money, right? It's not just the top 5% the billionaires writing the, the biggest checks. It's, it's important, the depth and breadth of, of the alumni connection to the university, because that filters into the local alumni associations and all the volunteering that goes along with that. The depth is really important. So to see that having dropped off from 60% to pretty well below 50 in the 40s in a short period of time, really from 2015, you're talking within the last 10 years for sure, is alarming. Um, I think we're in a slippery slope, a multi-decade you know, degradation of values. And, and, and here you look, you don't, you don't see it, right? It's like the frog in the pot. It slowly goes and goes. And, you know, whether it's the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, people are kind of get concerned. There's an underlying uh, degree of concern. But overall, you know, life is busy. You keep moving on. You, you comment like Bobby did, like, oh, my gosh, what a dis- disrespectful person that was. Uh, but you look up over a multi-decade period, and you're like, which is where we are today. And you're like, how did we get here? And um, well, there was a path towards how we got here, and and that's the bigger conversation. But on a personal level, I'll just end with this: I just try to um, take the middle ground and try to take a tact of I want to live in the state of love if I can. Therefore, in this, in the context of this conversation, I want to be respectful. And if I'm in a person that is 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 toxic and living in fear, then I'm going to try to essentially minimize my interaction with them so that I can preserve respect. I guess no harm, no foul. Like this, this is an issue that's, uh, you know, that's impacting our country at every level, you know, of government, corporation, you know, Princeton is not exempt, right? So it's, it's, it's invasive in every aspect of our life, churches, whatever, schools, right? So Princeton is not exempt and, and, and any other university is also not exempt. So how do you, how do you, we're going through this momentous change politically. And so how, how do you bridge the gap, right? How do you essentially um, maintain um, civil liberties and free speech uh, while um, bringing you know, a level of respect across all genders and all races. And, you know, I I think there's a pathway to do that. And it it always starts with leadership. And so I would, that's what I would say without getting into specifics is that I think I would like to see different type of leadership to um, control the message, sort of mediate the message, right? And get young people and all people to really uh, take on these issues in a healthy way rather than ending up in a divisive, conflicting outcome that frustrates everyone. And in this case, ends up in alumni saying, I don't know if I want to be a part of this anymore. Hi there folks, Sifu Slim here. So today I'm 61 years old, but I'm still concerned quite a bit about the youth of the world and the options they have and the decisions that they make. So I looked into the question of college expenses and I'm gonna have a discussion with a close contact of mine who's younger than I am and has thought about the same topic. He's also got a daughter who will in the near future be considering colleges and is already considering, you know, the best high school options. So those things are very near and dear to him. And he's also been involved with the alumni organization of his university. And so what I first wanted to share with you folks out there, it goes a long way to help this podcast grow 
if you'd reach down and hit the subscribe button and you also hit the like button. So I'll reach out with that right now. And if you can help us on our way to expanding and having more informationally and entertainingly valid interviews that hopefully hit you in areas that you want to hear about, that'll help us quite a bit. So I'm going to reach out now to Jason Jewell. I'm in Mexico on the coast of Mexico in Playa del Carmen. Jason, tell us where you are and a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Sifu, and great to see you. It's always great to connect. I'm in uh, lovely Santa Barbara, California, uh, one paradise to another, uh, Playa del Carmen. Is, <laughs> I've been to Cancun, but just Mexico is obviously a paradise, coastal Mexico. So um, yeah, that's where I am. And uh, my background uh, is uh, sort of, um, I've, I've done a lot of different things, entrepreneur, uh, investor, professional investor. I co a $6 billion fund. Uh, professional athlete. I was ranked number one in the U.S. Uh, for five years, played the world tour, multiple world championships and Pan American championships. What um, sport? Sport of squash rackets. So actually, and squash was recently announced to be in the 2028 Los Angeles Olympics. And I'm actually part of that effort to get that launched and successful and hopefully uh, segue into the 2032 Olympics in Australia, which is a squash supporting country. So that's sort of a lifetime um, excitement thing for me because uh, we've been trying since at least 92 to get squash in the Olympics. So that's a nice little go squash. <laughs> is, uh, is squash as old as tennis or how does that fit in with the history of racket sports? Uh, yeah. So an interesting squash is formally called squash rackets and the predecessor to squash is a sport called rackets and rackets was uh, founded in the medieval sort of 1500s uh, England, England and uh, France and uh, squash in the 1800s came out of that actually ironically in a prison because squash is somewhat of a um, well-to-do sport, although it's diversifying nicely in the last 20, 30 years. And then tennis, actually, the predecessor to tennis is a game called real tennis or jeu de palm in French, which is the game of the palm. The racket is in the shape of a palm. And also in the 1500s, and tennis came out of uh, court tennis or real tennis. So those are um, the historical context to both sports that most people don't know about. Yeah, Jason, you, you were both Francophiles and have studied languages. And I, I used to jog in the area around the Louvre where the Jeux de Pomme uh, building was. And so that's where in France, because it's cold and, and drizzly quite often during the year, and even in the summer during the French Open, they have to pull the tarps out and cover the clay at Roland Garros. Uh, they, um, that's where part of the history of, of uh, the Jeux de Pomme was, and right there in Paris, with the nobles going out there and they're hitting a ball type thing, which was a bunch of feathers, I believe, tightly mm -hmm. mashed down with some sort of something to hold it together. Do you know anything about how that that original 1600, 1500 thing of, of feathers was held together? I do not know that story, but very interesting. But yeah, there's plenty like a court tennis or real tennis. Uh, one of the main uh, rules, a lot of similarities and differences, uh, but the expression cut to the chase is directly from, that's actually um, a goal in court tennis is that you need to cut to the chase. Um, so yeah, I mean, sports are full of interesting little facts like that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring in the idea of winning and then there's winning at all costs. There's making the right decisions. There's preparation. There's how to be a good sport. There's how to shake hands and there's how to deal with loss. All those things are part of the idea of sportsmanship, winning and, uh, you know, exceeding your goals type of a thing and doing things as a team, communication, having goals, being uh, helpful to your teammates, understanding all these things. So I'm going to bring in uh, Bobby Knight, who's uh, from the Midwest, and he is a coach for more than 40 years of college basketball, the highest level broke all kinds of records, and he did this with lots of integrity. And he, his main focus was to keep his students doing their homework, going to classes, and graduating, which was very different than other programs, including 
Wooden's, Wooden's program at UCLA and they won 10 NCAA championships, but they have they had a booster, many of them, but one special booster who was kind of like the mafia deal maker who would bring in students and give them all, all kinds of enticements to have them join the UCLA program. And, and Coach Wooden didn't like that but he didn't stop it. So that's why uh, Bobby Knight has a problem, even though he likes Wooden as a coach, he has a problem with the ethics of the program. And if you're part of the program, he's uh, coach Bobby Knight saying that you're part of that problem. So here I'm going to let Bobby Knight in a video called Bob Knight unfiltered. The outspoken coach sits down for a candid interview, undeniable with Joe Buck. So we'll listen to a little bit of that. And here is uh, Bobby Knight in his late 70s, early 80s, definitely a senior citizen. And this will be in the final cut. Uh, you know, we'll take this video and put it in the final cut. But for right now, we'll have the audio and I'll let uh, Jason and the viewers listen in. You know, so that was ridiculous. Anything like that to use as an example. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Did, did society change during the course of time because we've talked about no i think people changed there there are enough people changed there that were tired of basketball of being the guiding light of the university and i won't go in any other direction so that that incident happens and then some student walks up to you on campus and says hey knight what's up or whatever he said in the that most disrespectful a, way that was a big part of it that was it that was that led to my being fired that, that was the end right there that was a huge part of it some kid came up to me and say hey knight what's going on that kid made a dumb mistake you know i went over to that kid and i did a lot more for the son of a bitch than his parents ever did for him <laughs> and i went over there and i said son let me tell you something you don't address adults like that under any circumstances and that's why i have no use for indiana university because they used that as a reason to get me out of there and that's absolute bullshit. so i'm going to start off with my look at that subject with bobby knight losing his job which was his lengthy career at indiana based on a young person who grew up in the age where you don't respect your elders. Now, I'm not saying that <clears throat> elders are don't make mistakes. I'm not saying that elders can be disrespectful, etc. But if you're a 20-year-old or 18-year-old, 22-year-old, and you someday want to have respect, a good thing to do would be to show that to people who are older than you and that are also who are also in a supervisory role. He was a teacher. He was a coach. And he was an icon at the university. And it's disrespectful for the young person if they have a problem with him, in my opinion, to yell out at a distance with what, we, what would you call it? An affront like, hey, you know, you have a problem and I'm not I'm not going to address it properly. I'm going to address it in this way. Over to Jason, if you can comment on on that uh, circumstance. Very unfortunate, and it's a huge um, potential conversational platform that you're launching here. I think, uh, you know, you look at societies like India, they are, you know, uber respectful of elders. And I think probably, historically speaking, you know, the human species was uh, at large. Uh, and I think humans, there's two two main emotions, love and fear, you know, we all want to be in a state of love and respect is obviously a form of that. Now, in terms of leadership, you know, you can have a Patton, right? A drill sergeant. And, you know, how do you, how, you know, how do you earn respect? I think, I think, let me back up. I think that's the question. Do you earn respect or is respect automatically given? So those are two different schools of thought. I, I'm more in the latter of respect is earned right and not guaranteed it's not a right although to have a a, 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 t a functioning team whether that's a marriage or a sports team or whatever right you need to have respect right? that must exist so so if there's a fly in the ointment then you need to 
you know, move that, remove that disruptive person from the group or somehow bring that person along for the ride so that you have a cohesive team. So, you know, but in society at large, right, I think you, you have to think about what are the factors that have uh, degraded, right, our behaviors and values uh, to the point where you get um, incidences like what Bobby Knight experienced and is, is happening, you know, at large, really, in schools across the country. You know, there's really no exemption to that anymore. So, so I think that's that's a bigger conversation that would be fun to jump into. But I I would say that I take you know um, I think we're in a slippery slope, a multi-decade you know degradation of values. And 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 here you look, you don't you don't see it right. It's like the frog in the pot. It slowly goes and goes. And you know whether it's the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know people are kind of get concerned. There's an underlying uh, degree of concern. But overall, you know, life is busy. You keep moving on. You, you comment like Bobby did, like, oh, my gosh, what a dis- disrespectful person that was. Uh, but you look up over a multi-decade period, and you're like, which is where we are today. And you're like, how did we get here? And, um, well, there was a path towards how we got here. And, and that's the bigger conversation. But on a personal level, I'll just end with this. I just try to um, take the middle ground and try to take a tact of I want to live in the state of love if I can. Therefore, in this, in the context of this conversation, I want to be respectful. And if I'm in a person that is, is, is toxic and living in fear, then I'm going to try to essentially minimize my interaction with them so that I can preserve respect, so that I am emoting as much respect as I can. If that is literally a handshake and I keep walking, you know, a hello, how do you do? And I keep walking. Or if it's more, I can maybe throw a hug and a short phrase, but keep walking. Or, you know, if someone's not toxic, then obviously you stop, you spend time, you have a conversation. There's more emotion and more connection and there's not, the the issue doesn't exist. But the key is don't engage to the point where you lower yourself into that state of fear and become angry because then that doesn't help you. Now, you know, you've gone down with the sinking ship. So my, my, my advice or the way I try to live is, is to, um, to preserve that, right. To preserve living in the state of love and to have an exchange that will preserve that, whatever that may mean. Every situation, every person is different. So uh, Jason, great uh, comments. Um, As adults, I jot it down. We want to be respected by youth, but the youth are saying, that some of what we are saying and some of what we are offering is not accurate advice and it's not accurate information. So mm-hmm. there's this generation gap that happened. And I and I take it back to the World War II veterans who came home at age 20, at age 30, and they were given the opportunity to go by the GI Bill to a college. And most of them could get into college and they got into college or allowed to finish up with a GED or high school, one final year of high school, they got in and then they, they had the, the four-year degree paid for by the federal government. And it was dirt cheap back then in today's standards, but for 1945, 1948 standards, a lot of people were still poor in rural areas, even in industrial areas. Some families had 10 kids father out of work, mother out of work, whatever. And it was not easy, but this this GI Bill allowed these young people to go back to college or to go to college for the first time and learn about things, including evolution, including the history of thought, including history, and then sciences, biology especially. And when you study all of these things, you start to look back at what you were brought up on, specifically follow the rules, (laughs) Christianity is completely accurate if you were growing up in America or Judaism. Those were the, the two most popular ones. And then uh, you could question that. And that put a rift among a lot of families. But since kids oftentimes still respected their elders, and the when they started to you know leave the home in 1948, 1952, whenever they left, or when they went to college in 1945, they didn't come home oftentimes in those days. It wasn't common to have these long dialogues with your parents, but it was more like the internal thoughts of this young man and this young woman who had served in World War II 
and they and they think differently than their parents did and their grandparents did because of the opportunity of education and because you can't hide the truth evolution happened and still to, the, to this day in 2024 there are people who are saying it didn't over to jason for some thoughts on this generation gap thank you sifu great comments um so I, I think the GI, my GI Bill, my grandfather was a recipient of that and did a lot of good for, for the greatest generation. I, I, don't think, I, I don't think that being exposed to education to get you to think you know, deeper and, and challenge ideas is a bad thing. You know, I don't think that is automatically disruptive and results in disrespect. Um, I do think that the GI Bill in World War II and the Great Recession and the Dust Bowl and all of that was was a uh, step function to the to the upside of of moving society towards an urban environment and then what is the cultural consequence of that it just means that you're you you're not an agrarian society uh, so in the 17 1800s america became an agra agrarian society and really what does that mean that means that they were uber independent so i think you know, moving to uh, in, in short, right? Because that's that is also a conversation. But you know, in short, uh, you know, moving to an urban society decreases some of that um, independence. So that that's an interesting cultural shift that is worthy of a conversation. But um, yeah, in terms of the cultural and generational divide, so kind of shifting here a little bit uh, back to that key question of yours, I would say that it's important for you know the older generations to, to, to be connected, right. To listen, right. Don't be didactic and, and, and pushy, right. Don't be uh, condescending and, and, um, and, you know, look down on younger kids, right. You know, um, try to, you know, again, lead with love, speak calmly, look into their eyes and contextualize it with current events so that you, you, you know, you're not, you know, anachronistic, like you, you're understanding, you know, if you're truly older and wise, A, we're all human beings. So, so that never changes, right? But the, cir the circumstances do change. So you need, I think, to connect with the younger generation, understand what current circumstances are, and help them understand it, explain it, and then, and then add the veil of, of humanity over that, right? So that a young person can say, you know, these are my goals. These are my values, right? And they can feel like they, they, they. I think that results in respect. And too often times, I see old people. They're either decrepit physically, right? And so that's not immediately for a young person that doesn't, you know, have perspective. They see an old decrepit person that has a feeble mind and a feeble body. Um, you know, that is not. Um, you know, that that's that's someone you you would care for, or you would you would you know, you would have empathy towards, right? Oh, you know, they're, they're not doing well, right? It's not an exchange of respect. Like respect means that you are of sound mind and body and you have wisdom and life experience and that you're, you're delivering a relevant message to a young person that would get them to listen and be respectful. Very, not nearly enough does that happen. Um, and so I think uh, I don't blame a lot of young people for, um, you know, feeling disconnected to older generations. And I think there's other factors that fuel that, right? Music and different cultural impacts definitely kind of can definitely divide generations. But I think that's the humanity one-on-one -on -one exchange that 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 prohibits a lot of ex um, generational exchanges that should happen, that that need to happen, that unfortunately don't happen as much anymore. Thanks, Jason. Wonderful perspective. Um, when when you were talking about uh, some of these things, I thought about back to about being a fair intellectual or having a fair intellectual discussion, which you and I have talked about in the past. And one of the things I thought about is the idea of embracing an idea. And then there's embracing a new idea. And then there's marrying that idea for better or worse through sickness and health. If you take the wedding vows, marriage vows, <laughs> and you translate that to this idea of my grandfather's religion was this, my mother and father, and mine, and I live in this town, and I go to this church, and I'm protecting that with this shield and this veil right. 
And anyone right. stepping in is coming in with a sword and there's no room for a fair discussion about any of that. And what I tell people who are in that field of belief, that fixed mindset with any subject, and let's take religion. I said, do you think your God and your God could be different from somebody who goes to the same church even or the same parish or the same you know, uh, denomination? If somebody else has a different way of looking at God and they have a different type of God than your God and you're arguing about that just amongst yourselves, imagine I walk in and I question things about the Bible, for example, or your God. And, I, and if they get a little uptight, I, you know, I might say even before they get uptight, I say, don't you think that if your God is all powerful, they could handle someone who has questions and perhaps disagreements over the Jason for that one? Sifu, great thing to bring up because that is divisive, right? We're talking about generational division and that's now we're going beyond generational and we're talking about societal division. And what you just said makes me think of, you know, really in the last hundred years or so, pick your point, but where the world has become smaller because of technology, meaning the telephone, the, the uh, airplane, you know, now computers and the internet, that, that shrinks the size of the world and, and creates connections uh, that didn't exist before, you know, you would travel 10 miles and that was the edge of the world, right? And so your world was small, and there was definitely groupthink, and um, in a way that was good because everyone was more or less cohesive. And the the things that I'm sure people argued about were much much more small and granular. Uh, but today we don't live that way, right? So we are in a melting pot. Uh, you can go to Finland and, and Colombia and some places where they're more homogeneous, but more or less the world is is a melting pot. And so people in that in that environment. Uh, um, the challenge is, is always the ego, right? So, and, and you do want to have beliefs, like think of the spectrum, like you don't want to just be wishy washer. I don't care. Anything's good. I can talk to anyone. I don't believe in anything, <laughs> right? I think it's important to, to have a moral compass and to have thought through, you know, the philosophical, you know, what is the meaning of life and, and where did I come from? And, and what are the values that I, you know, I carry and represent in my life as a person, in business and in society, I think it's very critical as a human being to to go through that process as a young person and move forward through life as an adult with with through that lens. You need to have that, but you you, you can't. The challenge is not to drive the ego and to to um, I think be confident. Like if you're if you're a confident person, then um, kind of like what you said about you know if you if your God is is Almighty, like you you should be able. You should be able to have these discussions, right? And we should have that civility as a society to say it's 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 so relevant to what we're going through right now, right? Is is the polarity of of what we're going through right now in America and it really the world at large is, you know, we need to have a democracy. Everyone should have a voice. The Bill of Rights exists for a reason, and that's part of going back to respect for basic human needs. And um, uh, and so people need to um, have this right. And, uh, but they also, it, it's a privilege too, right? You need, you need to be civil. So have an opinion, speak your mind, but do so in a civil way, right? Understand that you're talking to someone and they have thoughts and feelings. And so have, uh, have somewhat of a plastic mind, meaning that you can, you can listen to and not be threatened by other people's ideas. And I think ideally you're looking constructively for commonalities, right? So you might, you know, uh, get on your knees and pray i might get you know uh, you know um you know um I, I, i'm not i'm not i don't have a lot of religiosity I, so what do hindus do i don't know they um they meditate well, they're, that they're people so, to do the, the the walking and prayer and they're people who do uh, empty mindedness and there's you know, many different religious practices ways to connect hi this is sifu slim author of the aging athlete in this book, you're going to get to hear about two different groups of former high-performance athletes. One group, which is made up of 90% of the former athletes, does not do physical activity on a regular basis and tends to suffer the consequences of a sedentary lifestyle. The other group, which is made up of 10% of the former athletes, is doing physical activity on a regular basis and tends to thrive 
through the aging process, or at least has a better chance at coping with the aging process. We could have taken these folks to a lab and done all kinds of tests on them. Instead, we slowed them down and sat them down and asked them in their own words to describe why they're wired the way they are so that we all, former athletes and non-athletes, can use some of their inspirational and motivational and mindset lessons in our own lives. I hope you pick up a copy today. You can go to theagingathlete.com and when you have a chance to read it, I'd love to hear back from you to find out what your thoughts are on the stories of these aging athletes. Right. So thank you. Yeah. So, you know, you might sing different songs or have different practices or, but, but you're still pursuing the same thought is, you know, what, what is the meaning of life? Where did I come from? And what values do I espouse? Like you're still, so that's the core of it. You might be different songs. You might dress differently. And so, you know, but if you look through that, you can see the common thread and, and in politics too, right? We all, we all need to live together. We all want to live in love and feel love and feel respected and feel heard. And, you know, we, that we have rights and that we feel that those, so we, you know, that's the exchange and that's the goal. So you're coming from, this is what I believe, but you're listening to someone else in an open-minded way. And we've lost, obviously we've lost that, but, but that is what we need to get back to. Right. So um, that's a different discussion. How do we get back to that? <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jason. So now I want to bring up the idea of college education and college expenses, which have drastically changed over the last 30 plus years. And there are many reasons for that, but we're going to talk a little bit about how this is affecting young people and their parents or anyone else who's involved with paying for that or housing the kids or dealing with their stress or dealing with their loans that can go on in, in perpetuity. And now we have Biden talking about releasing people from uh, student loan debt and that type of thing. And who has to pay for that? Well, the, the masses have to pay for that. And the poor masses have to pay more per per household than the wealthy people do because the wealthy people have tons of money and it's a, such a low percentage to pay off a, a student debt or to pay their entire uh, funding, you know, to fund their five kids or two kids or one kid's college expenses. So these are fascinating subjects. I'm going to bring in Mike Rowe, who's a very impressive verbal wordsmith. I haven't used that word until I came to him and I came up with that term this morning. I'm sure somebody else is using it. And he's a media personality. His real name, Michael Gregory Rowe, American tele television host and narrator. He's known for his work on the Discovery Channel series and the series Dirty Jobs and the series Somebody's Got to Do It. So really interesting stuff. And he talks about four-year college degrees and what that's all about and the expenses. So we're going to go over to audio and listen to Mike Rowe. And this, this comes from Fox Business. What happened? I've been talking about it for a long time, but in higher ed, everything is based on the perception of value around the credential. Okay. And that perception is tied very specifically to the belief that it makes you knowledgeable. You get the degree, it's a reflection of your intellect, your wisdom, your knowledge. Right. I think that's over. I think that connection no longer exists in the minds of many millions of parents. I think they're starting to see the degree as a thing you purchase in a very transactional way, mm -hmm. in the same way that I believe a lot of universities have come to see their students as consumers. And so what's gotten arbitraged, if you will, out of the whole conversation is the actual knowledge that you would assume comes with a degree. <laughs> we were mentioning earlier, you know, right, not to pick on Harvard, but in 1955, the average GPA among the graduates was 2.55. Today, it's 3.8 percent. What? The, I mean, look, Everyone I gets an A. A lot of people are getting A's. A lot of legacies are going through. We just saw the president being defended by the Harvard Corporation over 50 counts of plagiarism. We saw the anti-Semitic thing. Put it all together. And you find a lot of alumni not only holding back on donations, but they're taking their degree off of the wall, frankly, because they're tired of talking about this. So I've heard this from my father, who went to a uh, called the 
junior Ivy League or the little Ivy League, I can't remember, Amherst, one of those, and in Amherst, Massachusetts. And he <laughs> says he's no longer going to donate to Amherst. He, he's been reading the Amherst magazine and the alumni magazine since he graduated in 1952 and, uh, you know, donating to them uh, within 10 years after that and had a great experience there. Had uh, Robert Frost as a lecturer, got to hang out with Robert Frost a little bit when he was a freshman. Really cool experience, was uh, the president of his fraternity, um, you know, did fundraising things, played golf, had a lot, lot of good times there. And I've been to the school and I really enjoyed it. I think I've been there twice. Just a lovely, lovely campus. Good experience for me as a uh, high school kid. And I'll probably go back there at some point and revisit this campus. Just a, just a cool place. But now, because of some of these things that Mike Rowe talked about, uh, these alumni are frustrated uh, with things that are going on and they're reading about it. And there's there's a lot of corporatization and, and seeing, as, as Rowe talked about, the student as a consumer. And then there is the loss of some of the traditions. Like if your father went there, you would have a little leg up, a legacy could could get there. And that meant something when you had generations of kids going to the same school. And I'm not saying you should just overtly give everyone an entrance path to do that. But I think there's a, a there's a reason for keeping the legacy, keeping the tradition in, in, in good time, you know, in a good way. Like somebody's a respectful, busy student involved in their community, involved in different activities, working summer jobs, uh, doing their work, uh, and then uh, doing doing well in school. It doesn't have to be a 3.8 or 3.9 to get into Harvard or Princeton, but they have a good, decent GPA, and they think and they believe that this person can handle the classwork. That's really important. You don't want people going to colleges that are not suitable for them. There's other colleges that are suitable. Not everyone is in the top 1% of brain power and can handle the, the load of that school. So those are some things that I, I wanted to run by Jason, who is a Princeton grad and had a really good experience at Princeton and asked him for his feedback on that. Well, there's several different aspects to think about when it comes to this subject. So um, uh, is there one that you wanted me to start with? Um, could, could you talk about your experience and some of the things that are a little bit more personal about Princeton and the alumni organizations that you've been involved in and your thoughts on that over the, the past decade or so? So Princeton is is got uh, notorious for its alumni. It's um it's it's a really uh, undergraduate focused university, and um you know you you don't have Yale Law School and Harvard Medical School and all that. So um so a lot is focused on the undergraduate experience, which brings just more pride, more participation, and um, the um the the reunion event which happens every you know may late may early june um is is a phenomenal experience uh, to say the least it's uh when i was a junior i i worked the uh, fifth reunion tent and the word was that it was the largest party in the united states after the indianapolis 500 and you just have to be there i mean they the bands that are hired and the, the parade and the fireworks show and just the level of energy and pride and participation is, is uh, really infectious. So to see the Princeton participation rate um, in annual giving drop from 60%, which is, I think, pretty high. I mean, that's every year, 60% of alumni are giving some amount of money. Right, it's not just the top five percent billionaires writing the the biggest checks. It's it's important the depth and breadth of of the alumni connection to the university because that filters into the local alumni associations and all the volunteering that goes along with that. The depth is really important. So to see that having dropped off from sixty percent to pretty well below fifty in the forties in a short period of time, really from 2015, you're talking within the last 10 years for sure, is alarming, right? If you see a long-term trend. Now, now you have to answer, why has that happened? Okay, so um, am I going along the right vein here? Should I continue? Yeah, definitely. Okay, okay, okay. So um, 
a lot of media outlets will posit reasons why um, Princeton in its alumni weekly magazine it will offer opinions. And I, when I have spoken to the university, you know, you, I think a lot, I think something's missed there. There, there are definitely a multitude of reasons, right? So COVID derailed some of it. Um, you know, uh, Princeton saying, you know, um, there's a multitude of asks, you know, um, the number of nonprofits, you know, asking for money, you know, has, has grown over time. Uh, the annual uh, the endowment is just keeps growing and growing, you know, 40 billion. Um, I don't know exactly what the number is, but somewhere around 40 plus billion dollars. It's, it's huge. So some alumni begin to think, you know, hey, maybe, you know, maybe I should direct some of my charitable dollars elsewhere. Uh, for instance, seems pretty good. Right. And a, a fourth reason would be, you know, politics. But but what what about politics, right? So you know, s- s- some some people with the growth of ESG, right, environmental social governance, um, is is a sleeve uh, and growing area of inve- uh, of investment filter, which looks for in- co- corporations and entities that 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 meet the UN um, SDR criteria for these factors, and they want to invest in or donate to entities that are representing these factors. And so if if a corporation or entity like Princeton is not doing enough, for example, to save the environment, that would be a voting mechanism to say, I'm not going to give money, right? You're not doing enough, right? So that Princeton will explain that too, right? And so all of those four factors that I just described, I think are in play. But I'm just going to say, like, in my opinion, the dirty little secret, which is going on is a different political factor, which is the main factor, in my opinion, that's 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 impacting us, the country at large, which is this growing, you know, extreme left and ex- extreme light, a right, right? That's that's pulling the country, the polarization that's kind of pulling the country apart. And so that's what I think and what I see, what I read, and what I hear that's going on, and and private conversations that I have, and people are like, you know, I'm, I, I just I don't feel comfortable. And I could go into more specifics, but I feel a little more comfortable just staying generic at this point because, um, you know, just uh, I am a Princeton alum and 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 I do represent some, pr- pr- some Princeton interests here locally. So because um, I think it demonstrates the point, right, is that, you know, and, and there's no, um, I guess, no harm, no foul. Like this, this is an issue that's, uh, you know, that's impacting our country at every level you know, of government, corporation, you know, Princeton is not exempt, right? So it's, it's, it's invasive in every aspect of our life, churches, whatever schools, right? So Princeton is not exempt and, and and any other university is also not exempt. So how do you, how do you, we're going through this momentous change politically. And so how, how do you bridge the gap, right? How do you essentially um, maintain um, civil liberties and free speech uh, while um, bringing, you know, a level of respect across all genders and all races. And, you know, I, I think there's a pathway to do that. And it, it always starts with leadership. And so I would, that's what I would say without getting into specifics is that I think I would like to see different type of leadership to, um, control the message, sort of mediate the message, right? And get young people and all people to really uh, take on these issues in a healthy way rather than ending up in a divisive, conflicting outcome that frustrates everyone. And in this case, ends up in alumni saying, I don't know if I want to be a part of this anymore, right? And the donation dollars go down. So that's a fifth factor that I don't see explained enough that I think is far more important. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but it's the reason that's not being explained that I think is actually pretty impactful in alumni's thought process. Thank you, Jason. So social history is an examination of how the regular people are living. The other types of history are diplomatic history or political history. Uh, militaristic history. There's all these different ways to look at history. And social history is one that's fascinating to look at. 
And I hope over over time, it's been increasing to look at social history. How are the regular people eating, providing food, finding work, finding clothing? How much travel are they doing? What size families are they doing? So you lose, you can use census statistics and examination of the past 200 years, perhaps, or since census have been around. Maybe it was around in ancient Rome. I'll have to look into that. Um, but if you look at some of this stuff and you examine the person that's actually a senior in high school, junior in high school, and they're trying to figure these things out and navigate that road, they have to look at things differently than I did in 1981 when I started college. It was very, very inexpensive as compared to now. And it was uh, the SAT scores didn't have to be as high. They want, I think they were looking at a more balanced student. Uh, you had, you know, done lots of activities. You were in uh, inter-school inter events, inter-conference events. You were, you were in, in different clubs at school. You had a job. You did this over the summer. You wrote a good essay. You were good citizenship grades in, in, in high school. All those things were important. And then we even had to do interviews. There was not a lot of, there was no internet at the time. There was no Zoom. So we actually had to go to these schools and do interviews for the, the ones that were what you call them, a more higher profile, more difficult to get in. They wanted you to come visit the, the school and have an, an interview with a college recruiter. I think that's the word they use for it or an advisor or something along those lines. But now college costs since 1980, so one year before I started, are up 169%, but pay for young people has failed to keep pace with that. So I'm going to get to the person here. We'll hear the life of a student uh, at school with loans. And this comes from Al Jazeera, and it's called U.S. Students Struggle with Cost of Education. It's about two minutes, and we'll let this thing run, and then we'll ask Jason to weigh in on it. Four years of college helped Rachel Pfeiffer find a decent-paying job she loves, but it's come at a high cost, $55,000 in student debt. Pfeiffer says she didn't quite comprehend the terms of her loan when she borrowed the money at age 18, or how difficult it would be paying back $750 a month. All of a sudden, I realized that I'm going to have to be eating, you know, a can of beans or a cup of noodles for dinner if I want to have enough money to pay all my bills at the end of the month. While she'd like to be on her own, Rachel lives with her parents. Still, she's one of the lucky ones. In this tough economy, at least two million college graduates are unemployed. Since the late 1970s, the cost of a four-year college has risen three times as fast as inflation, forcing students to take on more debt in order to pay for school. At a private university like this, a student could be left with more than $100,000 in debt before they even apply for their first job. With students demanding relief, President Obama wants to cap student loan payments at 10 percent of student income and forgive loans after 20 years. But Robert Applebaum thinks he has a better idea, and so do the more than 650,000 people who signed his online petition. Forgive student loans altogether. These same students who are graduating into this decimated job market are not starting businesses. They're not starting families. They're doing none of the economically stimulative things that we need all Americans to be doing right now if we're ever to, build, to dig ourselves out of this hole. Pfeiffer works for a high-profile catering company in New York City and dreams of one day owning her own. But first, she needs an advanced business degree. It probably will be another 10 years before I'm able to go back to school to get my MBA. But I will. I will. Like so many college graduates, she's putting her dreams on hold to pay off her student loans first. Kristen Salumi, Al Jazeera, New York. So 12 years has gone by since uh, this video and Obama. So it was interesting to see that the problem has certainly been on, on people's minds. And, you know, people have been paying, paying back these debts or being bankrupted by these college loans. And it's just, it's quite a challenge. So as a, as a father and an entrepreneur and a, a business person and a volunteer and other things, what is it like to, uh, to have conversations with your significant other and your other family members and friends about college for, for your daughter and the, and the kids of your, your friends and contacts and, and family members? 
I don't have a lot of, uh, well, thanks, Sifu. And um, I think that video, you know, the key thing there is inflation, uh, educational inflation is 3x in uh, standard inflation. That's that's the key statistic to focus on. I don't have a lot of uh, conversations about college and uh, I, I because I I I I look for the solution. Um, whereas I I think most people are not the, the the conversation and the thought process that people have. It's it's not focused enough because there's still the point is is that the game is changing, but people are still looking at the way it was. So that's a frustrating, exhausting conversation. So I tend not to go there personally. So let's, let's back up though. So my, there are two things that I, that I've experienced in my life that, that give me uh, some credibility here to, to even be at this interview you, with you, Sifu, and, and answer these questions. So the first is for 20 plus years, you know, I was um, a co-managed a $6 billion fund and was a generalist investor and did, had a top, top 10% at least um, uh, record of investing individually through stocks and sectors and econo um, economic turns from 2001 all the way through um, to recent years. So in that process, I was able to observe, um, for example, healthcare and we, own, uh, sorry, not healthcare. Yes, healthcare, but education. And we own some educational companies. I mentioned healthcare because I think of healthcare and education in a similar light in that in the last 25 years, we had more or less a deflationary environment driven by China and technology. But these two sectors of our economy were massively inflationary. And it didn't take a genius to look at that, but no one was talking about it. You're like, oh, wow, 10% price increases annually, less invest in those stocks, right? Okay, for the short term, and short term can even be for 10 years, um, that's a good conclusion, right? But you look at it from a broader picture, and it was always a train wreck. It's completely unsustainable to have double-digit annual price increases. It, the, you know, you're there's something wrong with the structure in the system that companies or universities can year in, year out, pass 10% price increases. It's not sustainable. So, so that's the first thing that I knew in 2003 that this was going to end poorly. Here we are th 20 years later. And, this, and the second thing is that in 2019, um, I, with four other gentlemen, uh, were looking to put together a um, global 529 fund for international students. So the bread and butter for universities are international students because they pay full fare. Uh, but the international students are dealing with foreign currencies, rupees and won and so on. And they have massive um, currency risk. So our thought was that we could create a 529 fund for these international students and lock in the currency, give them an investment vehicle to experience um, upside, you know, um, have, a, have a structure so that they could plan for their child's future educational needs and give the universities some visibility into the pipeline of students that are going to want to um, go to their universities in the United States to help solve the problem that uh, exists, which is that the universities don't have the manpower, the human resource to effectively market to these countries. They have no, no visibility. And this, this would give them a 10 year pool of people and visibility so that they can um, more effectively market, right? So those are the two things that I've done that, you know, that gave me both a broader investment perspective to say, this, this is something that, that will break and a closer insider's view talking to university presidents and Nakubo, which is the basically the CFO, national CFO organization, governing body for universities. Um, and just um, other administrators and uh, networks, uh, the former education secretary, and just talking at a more granular level and looking at the educational um, industry um, from, from afar and close. And so those are the two things I've done. And the conclusion was that um, this was always going to break. And I think the perspective is that, that I bring is that it's like if you had talked to the CEO of JCPenney's in 2001, 
and you would have tapped them on the shoulder and said, look at, there's this company called Amazon, right? And they're going to massively disrupt the way retail is managed. And you really should think about at the board level, taking it seriously and um, adapting your strate- long-term strategic plan. That that JC the JC Penny uh, Sears CEO would have told you that scram kid you're bothering me right we've been doing this for 150 years we have yeah. experienced board we know what we're doing well that sort of um, which is for most of the time accurate right so that's the way of the world right when things are going you know um, but you have to have the signal right you have to read the tea leaves to say w- when how, is the system, you know, at risk? So is is the in, the the status quo right? A stand of your current plan and procedures at risk, and it was right because Amazon brought the internet, brought a technological platform that Amazon dialed into, and created a business model along that disrupted the retail experience. That was the observation that needed to be made. And it wasn't. And oftentimes society just reacts to crises. So you go, you go, and you go, and you put your head in the sand, you keep, just keep it there. And eventually the, the tidal wave sweeps by you and everything is in disrepair and you the phoenix rises from the ashes and you look up and the world has changed. There's no proactive observational pivots that happen usually. And education in this case, is the same, right? So we went around in 2019 and said, look at, you know, the internet is 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 going to disrupt. You have not just online, but also the way in which people experience education is going to change, right? If Because we went to different seminars that showed a lot of emerging uh, educational companies that really tap into um how do you learn right and they can like think about personalized medicine this is personalized education right one size doesn't fit all and so that is what ai and the internet and technology can really help foster is the personalization of at scale right so you can't you can always personalize a concierge service but it's uber expensive but can you personalize uh, educational experience at scale. That's what the internet and AI and all these technologies allow. And we were, you know, going to the presidents of these colleges saying, you know, you need to pivot. And they didn't want to hear any of it. And we're like, we're going to bring you a pipeline of students that will help solve a big part of your problem. They didn't want to hear any of it. So we scrammed, we got out of there. So now look what's happening. Colleges are, um, you know, in somewhat of a free fall, right? Their finances are bad and getting worse. And, you know, 2016, I think Trump probably started it, but uh, I also think it was a natural cycle that the Chinese um, uh, it happened kind of coincidentally um, that Trump kind of um, blocked a lot of immigration into the United States, but it's also that China, their growth curve naturally halted. And so, uh, you saw a decrease of these international students coming, and that put further pressure on the universities. And um, and now, you know, we're likely to have COVID obviously impacted them more. And, you know, we're likely in the next 12 months to have a, a recession, and that's just going to impact them more, right? So you have you have somewhat of a free fall. And that, so that, that crisis that we're in the middle of, I'd say, for education, um, because now you have the new crisis, right? You have this whole, um, what we just described earlier, the, 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 politi- the politicization of, of, you know, of academia is churning off a lot of alumni. So the two main sources of income for especially, you know, the, the top 25 universities, right, are the international students paying, you know, high margin full freight and the, and the alumni uh, donations. So both of those are sort of at risk. So it doesn't take a genius to conclude um, that this this might not end well. And um, and so, but it'll just result in a restructuring. And so I think a lot of, uh, from the student's perspective, right, the consumer, right, that, that Roe was talking about. So the consumer is the, is, is the student. 
the student is now has in the last couple of handful of years concluded that, you know, there's no ROI, right? What's my ROI? You're looking at this as a product, you know, not an experience, a cultural, uh, it's, you know, just looking at it more simplistically as the product is not giving me the return that I need. And so I think then therefore the student will conclude, well, I, you know, uh, I'm going to go to a vocational school, right? Um, I'm going to look for an apprenticeship. You know, they're, they're taking matters into their hands. And so th there are things like that that will result in a restructuring of U.S. academia. Now, I will say this, too, um, that um, education, I think, is the number six United States export. And having a, you know, the most highly regarded academic institutions is a big part of the United States brand. And, and so having that brand at risk is part and parcel with other factors of, of um, uh, put, you know, increasing the risk of the United States, right? Uh, just transacting in U.S. dollars and that, what that might mean uh at large right in many different aspects of what is how do international citizens and countries regard the united states so so that star falling um not just uh, jeopardizes one of our largest exports but it also tarnishes our image and other countries perception of us so i think so it goes a lot deeper than just um this is an important industry um, and, you know, students need to, you know, get, um, something, you know, out of this investment. Um, it go, it goes beyond that and in, into these other areas that I'm describing. Thank you, Jason. So what, what you shared about not having these conversations because you're more solution oriented, um, that was helpful to me and just the way I think about certain things that I've been griping about. So I'm going to put that into my uh, my realm of expertise and just switch, flip the switch. So that's how I think I've worked on open mindedness, open heartedness, and I received that, that download from you. And I'm not going to take, I won't, I won't take a month of your, your program and your counsel to get that. I get it. So thank you for sharing that, first of all. And then uh, secondly, I think the video that we've just done, the conversation we've just shared, uh, when that does come up, I think you can send me an uh, email or WhatsApp of this YouTube video over to the people who are in a situation where they're being overwhelmed by life and responsibilities and, and health challenges and kid challenges. And, and you can share this with them. And it's a reality check, but it's also, also useful information and a useful strategy and a useful way of thinking, a philosophy for these yeah. people and, and educating their kids and educating their their spouses, their their parents, their friends about this, the way the economics of college work and the economics of planning for college and the and the way to think about this thing and the evolution of different industries that have their own return on investments, the ROI, all these things I think are helpful. And I'm glad you and I were able to encapsulate that in this uh, in this short conversation today. Awesome. Let me let me just add that I think that uh, to your first question of, of how can families and students think about this more constructively? So and I, I playing on what you said earlier, I think in the old old, old days, <laughs> you know, um, just going, you know, the story was always, you know, uh, every generation of America, you know, had more upside than the previous generation. Right. You go from the farm to the GI Bill. Now you're a machine worker. Now you become an engineer. And maybe become a founder of a business like the the wealth and the upside, the opportunity has always gone up in the last hundred years. So now we're in a, p a position where it's going sideways or down. And so before you had that playbook, you know, uh, getting to college or an advanced degree would beget you know more opportunity and and income. And so now that that is not as a straightforward playbook, how can families and students think more constructively? And my answer is um, think more carefully, right? So it's not a standard, play, it's not as formulaic anymore. 
right? So it's situation specific. So um, you, you, uh, I think in the last 10 years, it's well, where's the opportunity, right? So is there opportunity in the oil patch? Well, there was for 10 years. Then it goes to Facebook. So <laughs> is there a 10 year industrial industry that is a standout where you can pursue a degree that will give you, you know, that's hiring more and paying better for an extended period of time. And of course, today's world, you know, you might have a 10 year run and then you pivot to a new industry. So that is one strategy that I think students have been doing for the last 10, 15 years or so that, um, that can continue. Another strategy is thinking about, um, I mentioned earlier, vocational, right? Being a plumber might earn you a six figure salary and there's no real uh, competitive threat of that. It's all relational business, localized business, and a specific skill that uh, pays well. There's a shortage of labor. And, you know, you go pursue that vocation. If you don't have an ego, say, well, you know, I'm blue collar. Um, blue collar might be the new white collar. Uh, I think AI is going to put a lot of downward pressure on white collar opportunities. And so um, think outside the box and say, Blue collar is the new white collar, and I can still make six figures and have a flexible schedule. And what's wrong with that? I think a lot of students are going to correctly conclude that that's not a bad idea. Another strategy, right? Everyone's going down the digital path. Let's be a coder. Let's be a whatever. Uh, you know, um, uh, you, yeah, I'm not a I'm not a digital technological guy. So whatever the opportunity set is in that in that realm, I always think of coding, but. Um, that's where people traditionally think. And, you know, there's, there's always an ar arbitrage opportunity, right? Roe mentioned arbitrage. And so uh, I think of the liberal arts education, like think of what COVID has done to impact the in negatively the young generation. If you look at the data, you know, um, a human is intellect, emotion, physical, and spirit. There's four components to the human being. And all of those are sort of in free fall, right? But just to be data driven, you can see because how do you how do you uh, you know how do you quantify spirituality? Uh, I guess you could say that you know the 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 the, con the congregations, you know, Christian congregations. You can you can see that those numbers are down. But I'm really just talking about math scores, science scores, uh, humanity scores. All those scores are in long term free fall, but they they really had a stump, step function down, right? So the trend is down and COVID doubled down on the down. So when you look at kids and you think, what's the future? You know, I think historically all generations are, are saying, oh, I worry about our, our, you know, it's the kids, right? Every generation says that. But if you really look at the data, uh, at some point you're right. Like, wh where is this going, right? If, if, if it's the dumbing down of America or it's really the world, um, at, at, at some point, right, um, it, it's a crisis, okay? And I would say that that's happening and not and the social emotional aspect that is a huge scar for a lot of these kids that learned through COVID. Couple that with the, the test scores in decline. And what does that say for the generation? So I would say the arbitrage opportunity is is liberal arts. Like for liberal arts might be some somewhat declining, or it's is very much declining. But I think if you have the broad for for a small cohort, right? I'm not arguing for this is one strategy for those students that 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 see opportunity there. The opportunity is to have a broad perspective traditional ability to think and write critically and to present information and to have a high social emotional component they have an opportunity to be leaders in a world where there are less and less workers young workers that have the ability to social emotionally connect right and you can see that i'll give you one data point in new york i read an article a couple of years ago about living in an apartment building where they had to have a social manager because all these 20 year olds and early uh, people in their early thirties, they would just sit in their apartment. Like they didn't know how to just naturally go grab, let's grab a coffee. Let's go grab a beer. Like they didn't have the confidence or just didn't know how to approach people 
And so you have you you're seeing that you need like a social manager. Like that is something that's new, right, in society. So extrapolate that comment in a broader level in the workplace. And those students that pursue that strategy of of liberal arts and having a high social emotion, there's a huge opportunity there, even in a world that's going towards AI. And that's that's the other aspect of this falling intellect, falling social emotional, is that in that free fall, AI is now taking off. It's a it's an important cross section where you're going to see more robots and more artificial intelligence step in to fill the worker gap and the leadership gap. And that's a whole different conversation, but just practically speaking, that will fill some of the void. But there'll still be an opportunity for some students to fill in from a humanistic perspective and be that type of leader. So those are three examples. There are other, but others, but I would say that is would be my advice to families and students is to think there's no formula anymore. Think critically about what are your resources that you have available to invest? Who is your student child and what are their best skills? What does the world look like? Be realistic about it today and solve for that problem to give your student the best chance at um, landing on their feet, succeeding in an otherwise flat to down world. How can you go against that and um, find success? That I think be creative. That, there it is. And so I'm so glad, Jason, that you shared about the humanities. Um, engineering builds creativity because you have to figure things out. And the humanities do, too, because it opens your mind to thought. And that's the, one of the loveliest things about humanity. Once you hear the thought, you hear the teacher, you have to go home and create. My In my era, before college, it was all done with a, a pen and a, and a pad, a pen. And so you created these things and then you might have put it in the typewriter and handed it in. But think of how much creation you do when you prepare a speech, when you do a critical essay, when you when you write a short story. All of these things are wonderful. You do an art project. So hallelujah for all of the humanities and couple them with them with math, science, technology, and engineering. I think it's a great, a great thing to combine. And I wanted to share to the viewers out there that. This is the third uh, YouTube video that Jason and I have done in uh, the recent decade. And you can look up online for one that's called Richard Wolf, W-O-L-F-F, -F, on how you are being exploited, a conversation with Jason Jewell. And that's on my channel, The Real Show with Sifu Slim. There's other information about the Aging Athlete book and research that I've done done with Jason Jewell, Jewell Pro Squash Player. You can find that on YouTube. And then you can also have uh, your look at Experts React to the question of, is academia a waste of time? And that's on The Real Show with Sifu Slim. And that fe features Jason Jewell. And uh, I think this has been a great conversation. I'd, I'd love to do one in the future with someone, maybe Jason, about the idea of our engineers Coachable. And I don't want to give too much away, but just think about that. And uh, we'll have Jason either decide to do that or maybe connect me with somebody else on that subject. And Jason, do you want to share any information about how you can be re reached, either LinkedIn, Facebook, or some other source online? Hmm. Um, thanks, Sifu. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, this morning. I, I did enjoy this conversation. And look forward to doing more. Um, yeah, you can reach me. I don't have a huge social media presence. I do need to grow that. Uh, um, you can email me at holistic.investor at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach me. If you have any questions or want to reach out for whatever reason. Good. And you're playing in a, in a squash tournament. I don't know if that's already happened since the last time we spoke, but I think you were playing in, in a national age group squash tournament sometime in the near future. What, what is that all about? Oh, yeah. So um, I turned 50. So to commemorate that, my daughter's 11. And just so I have really taken a 10 year hiatus on squash to be a good dad. And that is the most fulfilling thing I've done in my life and probably will ever do, um, at, which never ends. But now now that my daughter's of, 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 of this age, I think 
a great thing for me to be as vibrant as I can, but also to, to continue to be a different type of role model for her. I think uh, I, my thought process was to uh, get the racket back out. So I'm going to play the World Masters in Amsterdam this August. So should be fun and see a lot of old friends. Uh, it's, it's great to be on the court training again, and um, we'll see how that goes. But there's no pressure, right? I'm not, it's not, it's not for a job anymore, but um, it's, it's, it's a different sort of a challenge. Did you say August in Amsterdam? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I hope you can send me the information on it because I have, I'll be in Europe in June and July and maybe I'll be there in August. And that would be fun <laughs> to see both of us. I don't think we've ever seen each other outside of Santa Barbara. So it'd be fun mm -hmm. to, to walk down and, and watch a uh, little of the squash and, and share uh, and share a walk around Amsterdam with you. That would be great. I would love that. So thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. And we'll reach out to uh, connect on a future uh, YouTube conversation. And I'm Sifu Slim at SifuSlim.com, asking all you folks out there to help support the channel with you subscribing down below and with a thumbs up like. And if, and if you're so inclined to pass this on through your social media platforms and through an email to friends, that will help this channel grow. We'll have more great conversations. And down below, if you'd be so kind, answer the question, what is winning all about? And how do you go about doing that and still keeping balance and not crushing your opponents permanently in a nasty way, but doing this idea of win, 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 so that we can all human beings, homo sapiens, do our thing, thrive throughout this uh, chance we have at a good life, and also be kind to the ecosystems, <clears throat> uh, the planet, et cetera, while we're doing that. So put those comments down below, and we'll talk to you again in the very near future. I'm Sifu Slim with Jason Jewell, wishing you a big aloha, happiness, and prosperity, and a lot of good, good times to come. Aloha, thanks, Jason. Aloha. Thank you, Sifu.